Hey everyone, welcome to my review of Mushihime-sama HD for Steam, released in 2015. This port is based on the previous port on the Xbox 360, which came out in 2012, which of course is based on the original arcade release of 2004. And then somewhere in between is a pretty crappy, perhaps better forgotten PS2 port of Mushi. And I say better forgotten because it's basically really inaccurate and surpassed by these other ports, so don't worry about that unless I guess you're a collector of some kind. But I think to start this review off, let's actually talk about the cave situation on Steam. Because, especially as of late, people do want to get into cave games, they do want to get into shmups. A lot of people are now PC exclusive players, I'm basically becoming that way myself. And so the place they want to turn, of course, is getting these games on Steam. So the three that you have to choose from are Mushi, Death Smiles, and DFK. And as much love as I have for DFK and Death Smiles, people do ask which one is the best one to pick up, and every time I will say Mushi. And the reason for that isn't particularly the game itself, but because of those three ports, this port is absolutely the most accurate to the 360 version and the arcade release, basically, where those other two ports, especially Death Smiles, are lacking a lot of slowdown and a lot of accuracy in that department. So Mushi is the closest you're going to get. So I want to start this review also by kind of just showing off the accessibility features of this port because more and more I'm starting to really appreciate these accessibility features because on the 360... Cave was knocking it out of the park with these features. Um, basically, the only thing they were missing were save states. But at the same time, these days, a lot of shmup ports are starting to like skimp out on them and stuff, other than M2. So, the first feature I'm showing off here, I showed off the global leaderboards. And man, how much sense it makes that the global leaderboards are built into the game. And you can see the scores within the game. What a novel concept. But anyway, within the global leaderboards you can also download replays and so I went ahead and found the arranged world record and that belongs to the homie Kiwi so I downloaded his replay and this is just me showing off the replay functionality feature which is really really good so not only are you able to download and play back other people's scores this means that we can also use this to preserve and capture high scoring runs in the future right um, so, a lot of players, especially players who aren't necessarily Western players, um, don't capture footage of their runs or don't capture video, and so sometimes it's really hard to see a lot of super plays or a lot of high-scoring plays, but if they're playing on the ports like people do with Fatari or now they're starting to do with Steam, we're able to capture those and view those thanks to the replay built-in replay feature. So that's a huge, huge plus in my book. And then I'm just going over here. I love the general screen options. So it lets you choose between 4x3 and 6x9. Six six Super important. It also lets you, I'll show you later on, stretch and kind of move around the screen. Which is really good for people who play on CRTs and in weird like tates and stuff like that. Because your resolution isn't always going to perfectly match um, like a standard resolution. And it freaks certain games out. Another thing I have to shout out is, so I run this on an Extron and then on a giant CRT, and a lot of Steam games and a lot of programs within the PC actually struggle to hit that resolution. So for instance, Guilty Gear will not run on my CRT through the Extron because it freaks out at the screen resolution. However, Mushi can do it. So shout outs to Mushi, Mushi for that. Um, I always love shmups that are able to do that. Some of them I can't play on my CRT because of that, but this game has it all, so it can you can bend it, move it, flip it, and then it'll fit in weird resolutions. It's really solid like that. So I'm also just showing off a lot of the different difficulty options. I'm really curious to explore. There's like an easy dip switch setting. You can boost up the extends, and then just screen stuff. I always turn off smoothing. I just don't like it. I like my pixels to look nice and clean and sharp, especially at higher resolution, so you can turn that off. And then th within the game is the one where you can stretch and rotate the screens. All those are big points in my books. I think all shmup developers, 
indie shmup devs, if you guys are looking into making a shmup, you know, especially a vertical one, please try and add those sorts of features because there's a lot of indie shmups I cannot play on my CRT because they don't play nice with my screen resolutions and things like that. Then what I also love about this port is a really solid training mode. And it was also nice because it helped me capture footage where I didn't have to run, run, over, run, over, run to get to certain stages. So I thought it'd be good to kind of just show off all the different modes and talk about them within this review because there are a ton, and that's a good thing. So remember those people reading my review of those Psycho collections and all those types of things, I'm saying, there's no modes, it's bare bones and stuff like that. And everyone's saying, what, all you need is the arcade ROMs, right? Well, check this shit out. So this is what modes look like. This is what, um, you know, feature-rich ports look like. So, and again, this is just as closely priced to those Psycho ports, right? And so, but you're getting way more value, in my opinion. That's always what I prefer. I prefer to see, rather than seeing a collection of ROMs, I'm always, always going to prefer seeing a really in-depth, comprehensive take on a shmup like this release here. Even if it is a little bit more expensive, um, that's still way more valuable to me than just a collection of ROMs that you could just emulate any day or or inferior to emulation to begin with. So the mode I'm showing right here is just the original mode. I just did a 1cc of that. This is uh, not the same run, but uh, kind of inspired the run anyway. And so what you're seeing here is a technique I want to comment on because so when you play Mushi, it has this really bizarre glitch type thing in it called, I think it's called Super Shot, that's what I refer to it as, if there has a more proper name, go ahead and fill me in. But basically what it is, is Mushi has two auto fire rates, and the port recognizes that, and again, another, another big, um, you know, credit to the port for doing that. So what you can do is you can set one auto fire to one button, and then another auto fire to another button. It's complicated even to me, who's been doing this. And um, when you do that, and then you hold the buttons together, you create what's called a super shot, which you see me doing right here. And the way you can tell if you're doing it is you'll be flying around at full speed, but your options, the little bugs, you know, little gr shooting the green lasers, they will pull in around you like you're doing a focus shot, but you're not doing a focus shot. So that's, I believe it's called super shot. And it's sort of a trademark way you need to play Mushi, because I think a lot of people, when you're first playing Mushi, I know I was this way. I had no idea about this technique, and so yeah, um, it's, I guess it's a bit of a handicap if you handicap if you don't know about it. It's kind of strange and awkward, and takes some time to get used to because I don't think it's totally intentional, but it's something you need to know. So I wanted to point that out because I want people to get started on the right foot. So go ahead. In the, earlier in the review, you could see I did the control setup and I had those auto fire settings go back to that screen and just copy what I put on there and then you can uh, figure out how to do that super shot and so that was original mode you just saw an original mode I've mentioned this again earlier in my other video I just did but original mode was actually meant to be returned to roots it was meant to be kind of a hearkening back to their earlier releases like Batsu Gun and their Toplan days, rather than the Don Maku games like DOJ, Ketsui, DDP, Dodonpachi, for the people who don't know all these acronyms. Because they felt like going with the older school Toplan style shmupping would be more accessible, and in an interview Akeda did, which I read the translation via Shmuplations, so shoutouts to them, I'll link their site in the video description, but in an interview, he was talking about designing Mushi, the ideas behind it, and what they were going for with this game a lot, like one of the main things they're going for is hooking new players into the genre, which I think they definitely succeeded in because a lot of people, when I talk to them and ask them, what was your first shmup or what shmup helped attract you to the genre, a lot of players do point to Mushi as that, or Futari, as being that shmup that did it for them. What's interesting too in that interview is he talked about the visual design and again they were kind of originally going for a Toplan style you know so it was going to be mecha like um, tanks, choppers, all that kind of thing 
But the reason why they didn't is because um, a new Raiden game was go was going to come out at the same time as Mushi, and so they were thinking, okay, uh, we we can't, you know, that's redundant. We don't want to compete with them. So that's why they went with this uh, fantastical forest uh, beetles, bugs, all those types of things. It was basically to set themselves apart from Raiden that was coming out. One thing, that last pattern you just saw against that boss, so I did mention that Mushi is the most accurate release to the 360 version of the three Steam Cave games. However, it is not completely accurate. There is still a little bit of slowdown missing. It's not a lot, but there's still a little bit missing here and there. And that boss pattern in Ma Maniac Mode, that stage you just watched was all Maniac Mode, by the way, um, is a place where that slowdown is a little bit missing, but it's not... It's not game breaking, it's just slightly more challenging because of that. So the mode I'm playing here, which took me 40 minutes to get this uh, footage here, what is Ultra Mode. So this is Stage 1 Ultra Mode. What's crazy about Ultra Mode is, of course it's insanely difficult, is that it wasn't originally even unlocked on the original PCBs. So you had to unlock it to even access it. And the reason why they did that is they wanted to be a surprise. They wanted to basically trick uh, trick players who thought they were badasses beating Maniac, and they're like, okay, what's up with this? What's up with Cave being, you know, total scrubs? And then, bam, Ultra Mode comes and beats your ass. So you notice that quick jump, that's because I had to fudge the boss fight a little bit, so I, it took 40 minutes to get the stage, and then the boss fight was underwhelming, so I was like, okay, I'm not gonna have a... I just bomb spam the boss, basically. I was like, okay, I'm gonna show off the boss, so I cut, did a save state to cut to the boss. Not a save state, but a checkpoint, anyway. But look at this boss fight compared to the original mode and compared to Maniac mode. I mean, Ultra is brutal. I do think, though, just playing it for 40 minutes, I was having a really fun time. So I do think if you're really hardcore about Mushi, I think the Ultra mode is pretty cool. Though I have heard the TLB in Ultra mode is absolutely absurd. Um, there's an article that uh, Juju Kenobi wrote for my website... Uh, around last year where he was talking about how he got into shmups and he was talking about that fight and uh, yeah he goes into that more detail I'll link that as well but basically it's absolutely brutal and I think there's just un unavoidable deaths and things like that so then here I really love this mode and that's why this mode I actually did the entire stage of it so now we went out of the original arcade 1.0 release and now we're looking at the extra modes which I think need more attention and need more pointing out because they are both of them are fantastic this one is my favorite and it's the arrange mode which is actually based on the ps2 range but then they added and improved some things i couldn't quite pin down what those changes were because in the in the interviews akato was pretty vague about it but um considering kind of the crappiness of the ps2 port um, i'm assuming it's just all an improvement so what's really cool about Arrange is that the scoring system has changed. Now there is a scoring system. So what's kind of funny is in the original version, especially in original mode, there's not too much of a scoring system really other than don't die, basically. But there's not like max bonuses or there's sort of a chaining type thing, but it's not really that good, basically what I'm getting at. And so, Mushi Original isn't really well known for having very good scoring. So the arranges and the other versions, I think, were made to kind of help compensate for that. So the arrange mode is a lot of fun. If you want to check out a really great replay of it, uh, Kiwi has a demonstration at Shmupslam where we really dig into all the different changes that were made in arrange mode. Some that stood out to me, the soundtrack's different, the soundtrack's killer, I like it more. Um, you can switch your shot types. So in Mushihime Sama, you have three shot types. Um, wide, medium, and concentrated. I can't remember the actual names for them. I always play S. I think it's the concentrated one. It's called S. And man, I absolutely love it. Your movement speed is ridiculously fast, but your focus speed is reasonable. The thing about Mushi that sets it apart from other cave games is that your concentrated speed is a lot more is a lot slower than in other games so it can actually be 
be really tricky to use at times because you're trying to make all these concentrated dodges, but your ship is so slow you just can't do it. And so that's why I like playing S-Type is because you're able to actually dodge while concentrated. And also, um, you're also able to kill bosses faster and get cancels faster. So I think from an accessibility point, I think S might be the most accessible if you can get your hands on the ship speed and get used to that. But anyway, one, one really cool thing about arranged mode I gotta point out is... I'm very certain they have reduced the hitbox size compared to Maniac. Um, there's debate whether it's smaller than Ultra, because I don't know how big Ultra is, that hitbox, but I think Ultra is reduced over Maniac. But a range is definitely smaller than Maniac, because I was playing this stage in both Maniac and a range. In a range, I was slipping, you'll see in this video, in this uh, footage here, I'm just slipping through walls of bullets like it's no one's business. It's actually really fun. Another thing about a range is, you know, there's just different bullet patterns. Um, I think it's a little bit more aggressive overall than Maniac mode, but not by a significant amount. And then, of course, the final boss here. In Maniac, you just, I believe in Maniac, you just fight the boss, but in a range, you fight this boss and then the TLB and that's a pretty that's a pretty awesome fight both both ways so a range mode I think is a big selling point for this game there's a lot of stuff to it uh, Kiwi's been discovering uh, including some kind of counter banking glitch and all this sort of stuff um, but for the, the casual players people just looking into picking up this game the range mode is definitely worth your time don't look at it and say oh it's an arrange it's probably just whatever I should concentrate on the arcade mode because honestly this is my opinion with this release and with Mushi itself I think the arrange and the second revision are actually better than the original arcade release I don't think that's too hot of a take I'm sure not everyone's gonna agree but I think there's a lot of justification for that um, just because like I said they kinda had a weird vision with the original release where they're trying to strip it back simplify it um, make the scoring kind of simple and sex accessible and stuff like that for newer players. But they kind of did a weird job with it where it has all these strange exploits and things like that, uh, like the super shot. Arrange also has super shot, but then it has some other stuff going for it that I think makes the scoring a lot of fun. And the smaller hitbox also is really cool. I think if you want to play you know, the original version. Maniac modes, well, it's still worth playing all of them, but I, I think the big selling point for that one is the Ultra mode, because um, I think Maniac mode is is better in uh, these other versions. So this next version you're seeing here is the 1.5 release, and I'll try and get through this quickly, because it has a lot of really interesting background. So the 1.5 release was made quite a bit after the original release, and the way Akeda described it is it's basically like the proper version of the game, like how Cave would have normally made it or would have uh, normally designed it, sort of, had they not been going for that Toplan style. So it's the more cave -y version of Mushi. There's a lot of different changes. Um, some of them are pretty subtle, like brighter. You'll notice like the colors are brighter, which I think looks great. Um, the lasers are blue now. Like the, the, It's more colorful and more vibrant. Uh, visually there are some slight alterations to the bullet patterns and things like that basically the idea is it's not so drastic that you'll be completely taken off guard but it's different enough that you'll have to like rethink and reroute certain stuff certain sections and things like that another big change it has this whole new scoring dynamic called the amber system or something like that where when you kill enemies and you point blank them, you get these little ambers and they create a counter and then basically as you go through the game those ambers build up and build up and then they're cut in half from stage to stage so it's kind of like a maximum where you don't want to die or bomb because you lose ambers but it's not as strict as a maximum because it's cut in half from stage to stage so there's still some sort of recovery and stuff like that so I do like that approach there. But anyway, there's some kind of interesting background to the 1.5 version that I want to point out. The big one being that, uh, so it was released in arcades, 
but you could only buy it for two days. There's basically, this was, you know, years ago, two, a two-day window to buy this release. And so, if you didn't buy the release, you didn't get it. And then, when they went to port the game for the 360, one of the programmers just, because originally it sounded like Akeda, this is going off the interview, kind of reading into what he said in the interview, Akeda re wasn't really supporting the idea of having 1.5 in the 360 version, because he's like, hey, that would be unfair to the people who just dropped all the money and, you know, came and bought the arcade release. But, um, basically, one of the programmers at Cave went rogue and went ahead and ported it anyway and then showed it and be like, okay, it's done. Cave's like, and Akeda was like, well, I guess if it's done, we'll include it. But what's funny is, when you think about that story and you kind of think about it from the programmer's perspective, it makes a lot of sense because some of Cave's business decisions, if you kind of think about them in a wider scale, are kind of bizarre like why would they create this whole new version of the game and then only sell it for one weekend ever and who knows how many people bought it but it sounds like not a whole lot and then that's it and then that's the only people who ever play this whole new arrange you worked on so I could see why one of the programmers would be like wow I just spent a year and a half or whatever working on this arrange for eight people to, you know not eight but you know like a small group of people to play I wish more people could play it Oh, I know. I'll port it onto the 360. So I think, obviously, in the long run, shout-outs to the rogue developer who... <laughs> rogue, pro rogue programmer, whoever, who did that, because... Yeah, it's, I think it's a really cool part of the release. I believe it is DLC, but, um, you know, this game goes on sale on Steam all the time, so just get it, you know, when, you, when the DLC gets cheap enough or whatever or the release gets cheap enough, get it, because I think 1.5 is definitely worth your time, and it's like basically this rare PCB on your release, so that's really cool. I love re I love um, releases that do that, ports that do that. That's the kind of thing I would love to see in ports that, um, you know, it bothers me when these games are just kind of thrown on, the ROMs are just thrown onto a cartridge or whatever, or just on onto Steam and say, like, okay, here it is. I personally don't think that's enough. So overall, let me just kind of finish with my closing thoughts on this release. I think the Steam release is absolutely wonderful. Um, 10 out of 10 stars. Even though it's not 100% accurate with the slowdown compared to the Xbox 360 version. Because I've played both versions quite a bit and there's there are sections where I'm like, okay, this, there's a little more slowdown here. But it's it's not much of a difference. It's just a little bit of a difference. Enough for me to forgive it. And the reason why I think this Mushi release is so important is because it has gotten a lot of people into shmups, and I think it's a great gateway between Toho players and shmup players. I think this is kind of like the linchpin release. Um, Futari could have been it, but Futari is not on Steam, so I think it's actually this release that does it. And thanks to all the arranges and things like that, there's a lot of content for people to dig into and check out. The visuals are awesome, the music is awesome, I mean, I didn't really talk about that in the review that much, but it's basically so obvious that I guess I didn't talk about it, but yes, the visuals and the music, absolutely phenomenal. I do like Futari a little bit more, in the, just overall as a game. Basically everything, I like Futari just a little bit better, but again, Futari is not on Steam. Um, you can emulate Futari on Xenia, but that's still kind of, you know, out of the way more hardcore and you do need a beefy PC. So this is going to be a recommended shmup um, for sure. And if you have friends who are looking into shmups and they're, they're Steam players or whatever, PC players, you know, this should be on the top of the list of stuff to recommend along, alongside stuff like Zero Ranger and Blue Revolver. I think Mushi is a killer release. Um, so yes, check it out. Buy it. If you don't own it, what's wrong with you? Get it. Thanks for tuning in, and before I head out, let me thank my patrons. Dingo, Anthony A, Ben Wynn, Brian Shiver, Double Vision, Depths 20XX, Dunpeel 2064, EC 2151, Full Set, Retro Schmupper, Gus, Kiwi, Jacob Spring, Jake Ryan, Joe Angelo, John, K, Quentin, Mark Sloan, Maz, Nathaniel Davis, and Electron, Okla Kugels, Omkal, Rhesosis, Sugumo, Young Money Sui, Plasmo, Utakaya, Bahoy TV 100, Malays, Meher Kalendrian, 
Thanks for watching.